In the summer of 2003, I helped organize a hunger strike. Its purpose was to protest a mental health system which more often than not is perceived by its clients as ineffective, humiliating, and harmful. Six of us came from various parts of the country to participate in the hunger strike. We wanted to draw attention to psychiatry's power over the people that labels mentally ill and to challenge that power. Krista Erickson was blind and our link to the larger movement of people with physical disabilities. David Gonzalez represented a small but important community of formerly hospitalized survivors of psychiatry who have returned to work as counselors in psychiatric institutions. At 22, Romy Sayama was there to challenge psychiatry's influence over the lives of people of her generation. She saw how psychiatry used labeling and drugs to control and punish young people who were simply experiencing normal adolescent issues. Vince Bame, also a psychiatric survivor, was serving on Delaware's Developmental Disability Council. As a grandparent, he was concerned about the drugging of very young children. Longtime activist David Oakes was the leader of Mind Freedom, an organization of psychiatric survivors and dissident mental health professionals. I'm a retired social worker. I'd spent more than 30 years helping psych survivors to assert themselves against abuse and humiliation by the mental health system. SSRI, I warn the people about addiction, self-mutilation, lapses of judgment, mania, suicidal thinking that, that they didn't have before, dystonia, tremor, Parkinson's, a whole bunch of problems. And then if after I give them all these warnings, they say they'll still take it, I prescribe an antipsychotic. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shipka's joke validated our experience. Psych drugs may not be worth the prescription pad they're written on, and here was a psychiatrist willing to say so. Dr. Stuart Shipko was one of the professionals who had broken ranks to support the hunger strike. To challenge the mental health establishment, we chose three targets, the American Psychiatric Association, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, and the Office of the Surgeon General of the United States. On the 28th of July, we wrote them a letter challenging their public attachment to the medical model of mental illness. In order to support their claim that there's a biological foundation for the model, we asked them to provide evidence, one, that clearly establishes that schizophrenia, depression, and other so-called mental illnesses are biologically based brain diseases. Two, that any diagnostic examination tools such as a brain scan, blood test, or x-ray can reliably distinguish untreated individuals with these diagnoses from individuals without them. Three, that there is a baseline standard for a neurochemically balanced normal personality against which a neurochemical imbalance can be measured. Four, that any psychotropic drug can correct a so-called chemical imbalance attributed to a psychiatric diagnosis. Five, that any psychotropic drug can reliably decrease the likelihood of violence or suicide. Or six, that psychotropic drugs do not in fact increase the overall likelihood of violence or suicide. Finally, that they reveal publicly evidence published in medical journals, but unreported in the mainstream media, which links the use of some psychotropic drugs to structural brain changes. If they didn't give us the evidence we asked for by August 16th, we would begin our fast. We assumed that mental health professionals would be sufficiently concerned about possible damage to our health and welfare and would respond with good research or would concede that there was none. We were wrong. The 16th of August came and went, 
So we did what we said we would do, drink only liquids for an indefinite period of time as we waited for their reply. Amazingly, people elsewhere decided to fast along with us. David, I've decided to join the fast before getting your email. Thank you for breaking the ground. I write from a country where, criti where views critical of psychiatry are barely visible, if at all. Your hunger strike serves as a fine and sharp reminder of the validity of the questions I ask of psychiatry in a society which largely fails to recognize them as questions at all. Thank you very, very much. These are websites from different places around the nation and around the world who have actually acknowledged us and our fast for freedom and mental health. We got a page from Ontario, Canada, a page from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, a web page from Auckland, New Zealand, so that's awesome, Santa Cruz County, California. So we're slowly starting to pick up speed. Why a hunger strike and, and why now? Was there something that sparked your decision to take action? I've been a medical social worker at the VA for something like 30 years and on my own time um, I worked to, to get human rights in, in mental health. During all this time, the media paid absolutely no attention. What the hunger strike is for is, is, to, is to, quite frankly, to provoke the media to begin asking questions of the, uh, the authorities, uh, the, the people who have the authority to shock, drug, and lock people up based on a belief that there is real good medical science. I mean, the reason they have that authority is that the public and you guys believe that there's something there because they have a medical degree. We know that there is little or nothing there, and we're asking you to go behind their public relations statements and look at what's there. They admit Truth is, the media are not only a factor in creating the culture, they are also a reflection of it. And since the culture has been too contemptuous of mental patients to ever pay them respectful attention, it's hardly surprising that the media would follow suit. My job was to neutralize the media's disrespect for the hunger strikers and gain their attention for the strike. So I assembled a 14-member panel of dissident but impeccably credentialed mental health professionals and academics to assess whether the public claims of the mental health establishment could meet accepted orthodox standards of scientific inquiry. Representing our panelists, Jonathan Leo read a statement explaining their involvement in the challenge. The basic tenet of biological psychiatry is that human psychological stress is an organic disease, meaning that the patient has too much or too little of a neurotransmitter, too much or too little of a receptor, or an overactive or underactive neuronal circuit. Whatever the problem might be, it's biological, and biological problems are best treated with drugs. All of us on the scientific panel share one thing in common. We are all frustrated by the media's belief that these theories have been proven. Psychiatrists have written a tremendous amount of material about these chemical theories, but it is very difficult to pin them down on what exactly they think is the best evidence supporting the theories. A recent brochure from NIH states, substantial evidence from neuroscience, genetics, and clinical investigation shows that depressive illnesses are disorders of the brain. However, the precise causes of these illnesses continue to be a matter of intense research. Rather than a straightforward statement that the chemical theory of human distress is a theory desperately in search of evidence, these authors instead try to put a good face or a good spin on a theory whose usefulness as a marketing tool has far exceeded its scientific validity. We would simply like a one-page listing of the studies... The panel's statement made clear that their job was to determine the scientific validity of studies that the three target institutions consider the best support for their diagnostic model. If these organizations do not respond to our request and the hunger strike continues, we hope that the media will not question the wisdom of the hunger strikers, but will question the silence from these organizations. Thank you. The press seemed more interested in mind freedom itself. What exactly is this organization? It's a social change movement run by people who've been through the mental health system. 
we're self-funded entirely by mainly low-income members, and we're totally independent. We don't have any connection with any other organization. Do you have any connection to the Scientology people? We have zero connection to the Church of Scientology or the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, and that's not to criticize any other organization. But psychiatry's main response, since I've been doing this work, is to claim they only have one critic, which is the Church of Scientology. There are other critics. There are critics who have been on the sharp end of the needle, and we're finally getting our day. NAMI is an organization primarily comprised of relatives of survivors. They support the idea that mental illness is a biological disease. We heard from one member who had received a copy of our letter. He wrote, you are a wacko. Please do not send any more of this crap to me. The blood of the suicides is on your hands. Obviously, NAMI doesn't have a, a David Oakes type person in their office telling them to, uh, to be polite. <laughs> to... <laughs> who was it who sent it? This is the first vice president of Minnesota's NAMI. The main response from the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill has been to hang up on anybody who calls, and we've decided to encourage everybody to keep calling. NAMI, the Office of Surgeon General, APA, keep calling and insist about leaving a message. A phone call to NAMI confirmed that media relations personnel were unavailable to respond to the deluge of calls they received. As of press time, no one from NAMI returned the call from the weekly. We did receive a response from the APA, but it was condescending and didn't contain the kind of evidence we had requested. They said, well, there are a number of textbooks and there are a number of uh, articles and journals that you should look at, especially beginners in psychiatry and so forth. Since APA medical director James Scully had not cited a single specific study, we wondered just what our panelists would choose to review. Draft reply to Dr. Scully, APA. Dear Dr. Scully, David Oakes has forwarded to us your reply dated August 12, 2003 to the hunger strikers involved in a fast for freedom and mental health. In your reply, you cited three general sources, including the recent Surgeon General's report on mental health and two textbooks of psychiatry. In examining each of these sources, we found numerous statements that invalidate suggestions that behavior referred to as mental illnesses have specific biological bases. And then he lists, mental health, a report of the Surgeon General, 1999, is explicit about the absence of any findings of specific pathophysiology. Page 44, the diagnosis of mental disorders is often believed to be more difficult than diagnosis of somatic or general medical disorders since there is no definitive lesion, laboratory test, or abnormality in brain tissue that can identify the illness. Page 49, the precise causes etiology of mental disorders are not known. Page 51, all too frequently a biological change in the brain, a lesion, is purported to be the, quote, cause of the mental disorder, but the fact is that any simple association or correlation cannot and does not by itself mean causation. That's from the Surgeon General report. Then, next, in the third edition of Textbook of Clinical Psychiatry... The panelists quoted a total of 10 such statements from the three textbooks cited by Dr. Scully. You will agree that such statements invalidate claims for specific, reliable, biological causes or signs of, quote, mental illness. In the panel's view, the questions posed by the hunger strikers are serious and fair. These questions are legitimate questions that any patient or family member or interested person might ask of any psychiatrist or a student, might ask of a professor. By not giving specific answers to the questions posed by the hunger strikers, you appear to be affirming the very reason for the hunger strike. And then it's signed by the 14th. Yay! This is the eighth day of our fast. I'm not personally sure how much longer I'll be able to continue to fast, but if it needs to, the fast will go on without me. And I just would like to issue a call to everyone most especially to everybody in the disability community to passionately advocate for human rights and choice in the mental health system. Due to health concerns, Krista had to leave the next day. Going into the second week of the fast, we had begun to feel the need for more support. 
So we asked five members of our scientific panel to deliver lectures open to the public. The purpose was to draw regular people to the location and educate them about the state of psychiatry and psychiatric research. Mental illness, by definition, is a problem that you don't know the cause of. When you do know the cause of it, it becomes internal medicine. And that's happened over the years. Uh, the one example I always like to use is achalasia of the esophagus, where you can't swallow right. Before endoscopy, that was considered an emotional problem. And after endoscopy, they could see that it wasn't working right. And achalasia is not even mentioned in the psychiatric literature anymore. So, of course, we're not going to get information from the APA and other organizations saying that there's no psychophysiology, no pathophysiology to mental illness. They can't do this. And the way they come up with the theory that there is a genetic predisposition is from kinship studies of various types of relatives, biological, adoptive, and so on. And the four main types are family studies, twin studies, adoption studies, and molecular genetic studies, which actually are attempting to look for actual genes for all of these diagnoses. But very interestingly, they have not found any. But genetic theories are very useful to powerful sectors of society that want to blame individuals for social problems. You know? We don't have to change society because you have these genes, you have this, it's about you, it's not about the society you live in or the upbringing you had. If mental illness is not biologically based, then how do we come to understand the symptoms associated with so-called mental illness, especially when the behavior can appear to be way out far away from, from what is, we would consider normal? What I do is I attempt to view the symptoms as a response to human emotional pain, feelings of hurt, loneliness, anger, fear, and shame. And the more that I, that I hang my hat on this model, the more I begin to realize just how fragile we are as people. Where is psychiatry and where are the survivors of psychiatry? The survivors are, are about self-determination. And psychiatry is very much about force, coercion, and control. In contrast to every other medical specialty. There is no other medical specialty that can force you to take a treatment that you refuse. Survivors wish for meaningful roles in, in this world, where psychiatry creates dependent surplus persons who really have no role except surplus persons. We talk a lot about what people want and what people need. And that's very different than telling people what they need. One is the development of the individual, and the other is the control of the individual. We also felt that people needed to be aware of how important the Fast for Freedom could be for the future of patients' rights in the mental health system. Mind Freedom is doing something that has never before been done on the psychiatric survivors consumers movement and that's we're taking offensive action in the past we've been able to take very successful for a period of time defensive action we've been able to stop certain laws from being passed but this is this is defensive we stop it for three years and in the fourth year they pass the legislation it's gotten so that People in the, in the uh, survivors' consumers movement think that they're taking offensive action when they beg in, in a very strong way. They say, we don't want the shock. We don't want the drugs. Well, what does that mean? That's not offensive. What they're doing is begging for you to stop beating them. And, and what we're doing is taking offensive action. We're putting them on the defensive. And in, in politics, that means, essentially, that you're changing the terms of the debate. Nobody else is doing this other than Mind Freedom Support Coalition. You people who are supporters of the hunger strike ask the mental health system through the media to open its doors so that patients who are within the system can get an opportunity to have a voice 
to share what's happening to them so that you can see for yourselves that this is not a group of disgruntled mental patients, but that these are real concerns and serious issues that need to be addressed. There are people out there who have seen their kids hurt, and they've seen their grandparents hurt, and they, they felt impotent to do anything about it. Well, they don't have to be impotent about it now. Um, you know, we're there for you. We're trying to express the anger and the helplessness that you felt before. What we need is for you to let the media know that they can't just ignore this. Go and contact the media, ask your friends to contact the media, send them these articles and say, do your job. Insist. Media, do your job. Why haven't you asked the APA for a comment? In fact, Marsha Kraft Gowen, the president of the APA, was within reach. She was on the faculty at the University of Southern California, a mere half hour drive from our location. So a group of us visited her during her office hours. She was civil, she was flexible to meet us on short notice. We had a pretty substantive discussion um, she said that they are thinking about, uh, if I can quote her exactly, she said, I'm speaking on behalf of the APA, we're thinking about having a meeting between representatives of the APA and Mind Freedom, either in person or uh, over a teleconference. So that would be a step. Um, but that, so that was, you know, that she's thinking about it, but they, they can't even commit to that. And Rick Burkell is the uh, director of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And he said that the reason he wouldn't respond to us, and, and we have his actual letter on our website, he felt too busy, and then he said, I don't want to engage in an ideological debate. I believe that what we are seeing with the drug industry is the application of ideology to commerce. I was put into the system by my parents. They, they had me evaluated at a private hospital and um, with, because they weren't happy with my behavior. And within, within a day, without anyone ever asking me any questions about my life or my family or my feelings, I was um, offered three different kinds of drugs, of which I refused all of them. My best friend, seven years later, um, had basically the same situation go on with her. her parents were unhappy with, with her behavior and the way she dressed and the typical teenage junk, you know. And she was put on Zoloft and Ritalin and she went downhill quickly from there. And I've experienced some of the debilitating effects that these medications can have on an individual. My eyesight has been impaired as a result of the medications I've taken. My, 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 I have a difficult time remembering facts, remembering places and things. I forget things from one second to the next. I have a hard time putting words together and thoughts together. And that's a problem that I never had before. And how, how do you kind of cope with those, those kind of maybe some misgivings of, you know, well, why am I here? Is this really going to sure. do any good? Or? Obviously, I'm doing something that the system may consider radical. Um, and of course, that's one of my concerns, is that when I go back to New York, I hope that doors will still be open for me. I know that, uh, that I've been losing at least a pound a day. Um, and right now, I think I'm finally below the weight that I was at when I got married <laughs> years ago. So, that, I mean, it was good up to that point. And now I, I think it's all downhill. And I, uh, I'm 62. And yeah, I'm in good health, but I, this is still a 62-year-old body. I've had some pain in my right kidney for several days now, although nothing terribly serious, I think. But I think that I couldn't not do this. I think that, that this is, psychiatry is so far out of control right now that, that there was just no choice but to, to take some kind of action against it. In the second week of the fast, the solidarity among the fasters was showing cracks. 
For one, we couldn't agree on our goals. I would be satisfied if at the minimum, NAMI, the APA, and I mean, yeah, NAMI, the APA, and the Surgeon General would at least acknowledge that they need to reevaluate the evidence. It would be wonderful if the New York Times and the Washington Post would cover it, and they'd cover it in a way that showed understanding of the contrast between their behavior and ours. I never expected anything, so that really didn't factor into to whether or not I would consider this to be a victory. Certainly it's icing on the cake, but I think that, yeah, it is all about the media coverage, and if we, if we get something national and we can raise public awareness even, you know, a hair, then, then we've already, you know, won. Oaks says health insurers are increasingly favoring drug treatment over time-intensive counseling. Many of our members choose to take prescribed psychiatric drugs, but they join us in saying that the choice is being squeezed out of the mental health system. Though we'd had relatively decent local and international coverage, the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times refused to acknowledge our event. In fact, an LA Times editorial writer told me the hunger strike lacked a publishable hook. Hmm. Huh. For health reasons, David Oakes left as the fast entered its third week. We still had no response from the Surgeon General's office, so feeling I had nothing to lose, I wrote a letter to President Bush asking his office to apply a little pressure. Let's call him a jerk. I don't call him a jerk. The Surgeon General is a jerk because he doesn't, you know, respond to the hunger strikers. We didn't write in there that he's a jerk. I mean, we just said that that, that he's being impolite, basically. Uh, by I, don't, I don't think that's the wise thing to say. Yeah. People that are against what we're addressing are going to use everything and any little thing they can to undermine what we're addressing. And what do you if think they they're going to do the that's worse than us, they've already done? If they can put the focus on us and question our character rather than keep the focus on the issues, that's why I'm saying it would be more appropriate for you to say the Surgeon General is dodging the request for evidence. The Surgeon General is being offensive because it keeps the focus on the issues we're addressing. Let's not make this a character kind of thing, you know, because then they're going to turn around and do the same thing to us. 90.7 KPFK Los Angeles, a fast for freedom in mental health. That's what we're going to talk about today. Well, if you look at uh, books and films like Snake Pit and Cuckoo's Nest, I think the implication is that everybody that's locked up is a danger or potentially dangerous to themselves or the, other people. The, the fear mongers play on that belief that mental patients, in, in quotes, are a danger to themselves and others. I've worked on an inpatient unit on a, in a psychiatric facility, facility in New York. And ironically, I actually felt safer on that psychiatric unit than I did on some of the streets of New York City. <laughs> it's a small percentage of the, uh, of the population that engages in criminal acts, too. I mean, why pick on these people when there's, there's no evidence that they're any more violent than anyone else? God, what a great point. We ran into the common misconception that psychiatrically labeled people are always free to go off their medication. In fact, there's a law in New York City right now called Kendred's Law, which has forced numerous people into treatment against their will. And, and there's, there's a law in California just, just recently passed that, that allows uh, people living in the community to be drugged against their will. I mean, the fact is that the laws are going the other way. It's becoming more repressive, not mm -hmm. less repressive. Shock therapy. There are some very uh, famous people that say, hey, I benefited from Mike Wallace, 60 Minutes, says it helped me. Uh, I'm not depressed. We, we talk about these problems um, as though they are only problems. It, it seems to me that there's a function for depression. I mean, we used to say someone was depressed, and there, there may have been a cause for that that was, that was worth uh, looking into. Now we don't say you're depressed. We say you have depression, Oops. and we have to wipe it out. Well, um, fe fevers uh, have, have a role, too. I mean, they tell you that something is going wrong in the body. And I think depression may tell you that something's going wrong in your family or in your community, That's and that ought to be looked at. Well, I used to talk about the drug problem on the radio, and one day 
it occurred to me, wait, it's a drug symptom. It's not a drug problem, really. You have to go deeper. That's what you're saying. Maybe depression or some of these other problems are calls to introspection. For the record, the president of the APA did not call for a meeting or teleconference. The APA restated its position in a press release. It appealed to public sympathy by referring to the, quote, burden and costs of mental illness, end quote. It also endorsed President Bush's new Freedom Commission on Mental Health, whose stated goal was, quote, to protect and enhance the rights of people with mental illness, end quote. Our panel of professionals replied to the press release in a six-page letter to Dr. Scully, plus a page of endnotes, once again meticulously analyzing the APA's stated positions and documenting their failure to provide supportive evidence. The APA had stated that mental disorders now rank second in societal burden behind only cardiovascular conditions in established market economies. That statement reflects less the pace of science than the pace of commerce, our panelists replied. Their exasperation was evident. It's been more than 10 years since the fast for freedom ended, and some change may be on the horizon. In 2013, weeks before the APA published the fifth edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the National Institute of Mental Health rejected its diagnostic approach on the grounds that DSM diagnoses are based on a consensus about clusters of observed and defined behavior. They continue to call these symptoms. They never say what they are symptoms of. NIMH Director Thomas Insel admitted in a blog post that there is now good evidence that many individuals with serious diagnoses do better in the long run without the use of antipsychotic drugs. As for the result of the Fast for Freedom, one of our panelists, UCLA Professor David Cohen, described it best. We had received more attention than he expected, but less than we deserved. Clearly, we had presented psychiatry a challenge it was unable to meet. We opened a door. A new generation of survivors and their supporters will march through it with new challenges. Thank you.